queen almost. Uh, hopefully you noticed the 3D pumpkins out in front of the chapel. They're in progress, but um, we are making pumpkin jack-o'-lantern, I guess, uh, types of sculptures. Um, so traditionally, Halloween is an honoring of the death of people, of, of the dead. The dark shadows of ourselves are playfully displayed and acted out. Fear is cool on this day. Being scared is fun. We can be scary, we can pretend to be something or not, and still get rewarded for it with candy, trick or treat. It's also a time of year about transition and paradox. Summer's abundance, moving into the winter's scarcity, life into dormancy and death. It is said that this time of year, the veil between the two worlds of life and death is the thinnest. Souls return to visit and some come to make mischief. And some believe that communication with the other side is more possible at this time. I love Halloween. It's my favorite time of year. I made that witch. <laughs> it's about 15 feet tall. Um, yeah, it was fun. And uh, that's Mr. Um, Burbank and I at a Halloween. And then that's my daughter. So I love Halloween. I'm a good storyteller, good scary, scary storyteller. Um, I love the fire. I love scaring people. But I also love Halloween because it's really sacred to me. My mom passed away on Halloween 12 years ago. As you can see here, she was a vital, vibrant woman. Uh, she also struggled with Alzheimer's for 17 years, and she lost the ability to speak. It's the day her soul transitioned from this world to the next. Trick and treat. That's what it was like for me by sitting with my mom on the day she died. And you might, you might ask, how was it a treat? <laughs> um, I can see the trick, but how was it a treat? I'll come back to that later. First, the trick. How do I hold space for this moment? Oh, there it is. That's the trick. How do I hold my own grief and fear with my own courage and grace while she's going through this incredible transition time. Treat. Being honored, the privilege to be there for her, I can never imagine not having that in my life. So I'm very grateful. The soul, what is it? So to me, the soul is one's essence in the form of energy that is connected to all things, here and beyond, to me, to you, to the trees, to creativity, to the mysteries, to the unknown, where the human and the divine are united. I feel it when I make art. I feel it when I walk in the woods, meditate, hear music, laugh with friends, fall in love, face life's struggles. As with most people, my own soul searching began out of pain and suffering, confusion, and the desire to find meaning and comfort. I would use art, as you can see, to kind of figure it out. <laughs> um, but before the search began, my expressions were always externally driven. And this led me to be feeling very unfulfilled. So I would turn inward with the practices of art, meditation and yoga. I gave myself space. 
I was seeking comfort and relief from the suffering, and sometimes I got it, and sometimes I didn't. I got something in, instead, though. I got a lot of new information than I had had before that. I like to call those the gifts in the darkness. It turns out, in order to feel fulfilled, fully human, we have to feel everything. And most of us would prefer not to feel bad <laughs> or sad or angry. Uh, but that's life. And I'd rather live 100% of my life than only 50%. So how to do that? Mindfulness. You've heard me talk about it before. Sometimes we practice it a little. It's becoming more popular, thank goodness. Um, it's really about paying attention. It's really as simple as that. It's not as easy, but it's simple. We attend to our whatever's happening at the moment with compassion, curiosity, non-judgment, non-attachment. We engage all of our senses so that our mind, body, heart, and soul are together on this. Again, sounds easy. So, how do we do it? Well, for me, prior to learning this tactic of life uh, tool, uh, my limbic system was very active. <laughs> I would call it reactive, actually. And it was where my emotions and my behavior were always just <laughs> ready to go. And I didn't pause. I didn't give it the time. So when I began this practice of trying to stillness, trying to be still and be quiet and focus on what is important, I was able to give space between my reactions and my actions and instead be responsive. So in a way, it's like responsibility, but really it's my ability to respond rather than react. Because, you know, when we make reactive decisions, sometimes we act out. Sometimes we don't pr present our best self fo forward. Um, so I needed to do that because I was struggling. I fail a lot. I'm not always on it. But I keep trying. And that's what this practice is wonderful about because it just allows for you to continue to try. Every breath is a new opportunity. Every moment is a new opportunity to try to be your best self. I believe every single person in the world wants to be their best self, but a lot of this stuff gets in the way. Our fears lead us. But here's the trick. The past cannot be changed. Sorry. <laughs> and when we try, it turns to depression. We can't control the future. And when we try, it turns to anxiety. We can't control this. It frightens us. And it's a huge waste of energy. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> we get stuck sometimes with someone hurting us, and we get defensive or stressed or depressed. We get on, stuck on what we want, we get rigid, we get stressed out, fatalistic, aggressive. These can become our unconscious practices that can shape our lives in negative ways, actually causing physical disease, dis-ease. My own discomfort and the challenges in my life, paired with my reactive mind, led me to mental health issues of anxiety and depression, physical health problems of infertility and breast cancer. What if I could be present with the unpleasant things and still be okay? What if I could give the space to that, what is happening, because sometimes the present even stinks, right? <laughs> what if I could be with all that and be okay? So this practice cultivates acceptance and builds resilience. Fear does not have to control me. Fear is a treat when it's met as a friend. 
and fear is a trick when it's met as an enemy. Why not befriend it? It's a part of you. Why would you put aside a part of you when it's just asking for your attention? It's like a little child. How could you deny a little child their love? So I thought we would do a quick practice about uh, what it feels like when you cannot receive because we are closed off with fear or whatever other situation is occurring for you and it, it causes you to be rigid. So in this way, we're going to try to be um, open, kind, vulnerable, and aware and notice the quality of our mind and our body and our emotions to let go that the fear has on us. But the first, let's see what that fear feels like. So take your fists to your hands and make fists and grip them as tight as you can. <coughs> Dig your fingernails into your, and really, and now you can feel the muscles up your arms and now I'm feeling it in my entire body. I'm going through my teeth, my eyes, and, uh, everything. All right, ready? Yeah. All right, ready? One, two, three, let go. It's a relief. What happens? Take a look at your hands. See my hands are still curled because the muscle memory from that experience is saying, keep your hands closed, <laughs> right? I've just made that muscle so strong. So now I have to open them up very consciously. So now open your hands up real consciously. Now you can take more of a relief sigh because that struggle is a waste of energy. So being open to receive things, you can't be like this. It's impossible. You can't be like this. You can't, you know? We can't deny those feelings. Otherwise, they're just going to come find you. We all know that. So what if we can just be with it? So holding yourself here for just a moment in pause. You might want to take a nice deep breath in and out gently. You can close your eyes if you want. And just notice what's happening for you. It's different for everyone. Everyone's at a different place. Maybe you notice how your body feels. Maybe you feel awkward about doing this. Maybe your mind is busy thinking of something, either from the past or in the future. We know how that works or doesn't work. So instead of following all those thoughts and feelings and just getting on the bus, what if you could just observe them? Just objectively see the thought, whatever it is, and let it go. Let you feel the feeling, let it go. And then the breath is often used as a tool to bring yourself back to you. It's right here, it's available at all times, thank goodness. So following that breath, finding where it is in your body, is it in my nose, is it in my throat, where I notice it most, that's one way. There's so many other ways become present. If, if you're having an anxiety attack, maybe it's not within your own body that you want to notice. Maybe it's something external so that you're not having to feel that intensity right now. And as soon as that intensity lessens, maybe you can go back inside. So all of these techniques are very helpful for you, for all of us. And we become better to, for, towards ourselves and better for one another.
moments before my mom died, fully present with the grief and the grace, the veil between the worlds of the living and dead lifted. Without words, my mom spoke to me. She said, be vulnerable, be gentle, trust the unknown and be brave. As I gave this moment the space to settle into my heart, she said another thing to me. She said, I love you. I hadn't heard that in 17 years at the time, but she couldn't talk. And she still wasn't talking, but I could hear her because I got quiet. Love each other, but most important, love yourself. It starts there. The last moment of my mother's life were like the autumn leaves currently bursting forth with color and light of the sun before they fall. The first time in a week, my mom's eyes opened with a radiant beaming light I can only explain as divine energy. Then, like the last leaf falling from the tree, she closed her eyes and let go. Had I been too afraid to sit with her during this time, I would have missed the most important thing in my life. And I, I should be there for her. She was there for me, even though it was hard, and it still is, obviously. <laughs> it doesn't go away. Your, your fears, your, your feelings of difficulty don't go away with this practice. They just allow space for it. So I hope you use your fears, your insecurities, to lead you to your courage and your authenticity. Hold space for your scared self and your sacred self that will lead you to your true self. Trick and treat.